landmark case of Brown versus the Topeka, Kansas Board of Education. That decision launched a stormy era of school desegregation, tearing down a century of separate but equal school systems and prompting violent resistance beginning in the South. After being ordered to desegregate his high school in 1956, Clinton, Tennessee was brought to the brink of anarchy. There had been mobs in the square before the courthouse and riots that had to be broken up by the National Guard. And a white Baptist minister was beaten up on Broad Street. The violence in Clinton was news all over America and much of the rest of the world. Unlike Clinton, Little Rock, Arkansas had no history of racial strife. It was considered by many to be a progressive southern town. Its public transportation, its parks and libraries were already integrated. The Little Rock School Board, in compliance with the 1954 Supreme Court ruling, drew up a plan to admit nine black students to the all-white Central High School in September of 1957. The stage was set for a model effort at peaceful desegregation. But Little Rock was hardly united about public school integration. That summer, reactionary forces agitated to keep blacks out of Central High. And when we seek by any means, whether legal or illegal means, to integrate the races in our school system, it is then an effort to undo what God himself has already done. The Segregationist Capital Citizens Council appeared before the Little Rock School Board, demanding that Central High be kept all white. When the council invited Georgia Governor Marvin Griffin to speak in Little Rock, he urged Arkansas to join his state in rejecting school desegregation. Facing an election every two years, Arkansas's governor, Orville Faubus, knew the issue of school integration could cost him politically. He seemed to take his cue from Griffin, saying, if Georgia doesn't have to integrate, why does Arkansas have to? You regard yourself as a preservator of the peace, is that correct? Yes. A preservator of That's my obligation. Now that is a word which I am told has crept into your vocabulary only since Governor Griffin is your guest in the mansion here. And it is a word, preservatory, which Governor Griffin has used for a considerable length of time. I'm suggesting, of course, that it's mere coincidence that perhaps you did talk about preservatory. No, we certainly did not. Uh, if that is true, then it is a coincidence, because I wasn't aware, and I'm not aware yet until you said so, and I have no reason to doubt your word that he has used that language, but that is a natural uh, word for the chief executive. I'm sure that under similar circumstances it might have been used by the governor of any state. Faubus' words began to have an effect. The preservators cast the first stone at the home of the advisor for the nine Little Rock students, the local NAACP director, Daisy Bates. Crosses have been burned on her front lawn three times. Just two weeks ago, Vandals broke a window in her home. She and her husband have had to stand guard around their home at night with guns for self-protection. Forrest recruited the Mother's League, a segregationist front group, to file an appeal to keep Central High all white. I have reports of caravans. And when the governor testified that caravans of white racists would descend on Little Rock if the integration plan went ahead, the local court agreed to block desegregation. But federal district court judge Davies nullify that court injunction, finding no evidence of possible violence. United States District Judge Ronald Davies has reaffirmed his ruling that integration must commence at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, despite the apparent opposition of Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas. The latest order of the federal court is clear, and the plan of desegregation ordered by the federal court is still in full force and effect. And what does that mean for tomorrow morning? That means the schools are open to the colored children. Forbes then acted, in his words, to avoid the very clear danger of a race riot. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. I call the governor's attention to the fact that after almost a week of sensational developments brought about by his own action, the Little Rock police have not had a single case of interracial violence reported to them. This is clear evidence that the governor's excuse for calling out the guard is simply a hope. I am not defying the federal court order. 
I am merely carrying out my obligation to preserve the peace. There has not been a halt to integration in the state. On Monday, September 3rd, with 250 guardsmen at the school and tensions running high among them, the school board told the nine black students to stay home. We requested a temporary stay in the matter of school desegregation in the Little Rock Public Schools on the basic ground that it is impossible to carry on education for either colors or white children under the problem situation. Tuesday, September 4th, the nine Little Rock pupils set out for Central High School and to make history. I was surprised at the level of hostility. But I think once we got into the midst of it, we agreed that it was more than just our going to that school that was important. That we were thrust into a series of events that required our trying to complete them. Eight of the nine students got as far as the front door of Central High. The National Guard refused to let them into the school. Emboldened by the tacit support of the soldiers, a white mob outside the school had earlier turned on the ninth student, 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford, who had come to school by herself on a bus. Eckford and the other eight returned home that afternoon, and on advice from the NAACP, they stayed away from Central indefinitely until it was safe to go back in. As the stalemate dragged on, Faubus became suspicious that his executive authority might be curtailed. He ordered Arkansas guardsmen to surround the governor's mansion to protect him from possible federal arrest. Through his press secretary, he fired off a warning to President Dwight Eisenhower. The situation in Little Rock in Arkansas grows more explosive by the hour. If my executive authority as governor to maintain the peace is breached, then I can no longer be responsible for the results. In blocking school integration in Little Rock, Orville Faubus placed Arkansas in open defiance of a federal court order and the federal government itself. The racial unrest at Central High was played out on television. The crisis forced President Dwight Eisenhower into a reluctant showdown with Orville Faubus. The governor left for a meeting with the president in Newport, Rhode Island to obtain a one-year delay in desegregating the schools. Are you optimistic that something will come of it that will help resolve the problem? Yes, I'll say that I'm optimistic. Eisenhower was not an enthusiastic supporter of school desegregation, but he knew the courts had to be obeyed. The president refused the governor's plea for a delay. He believed he had Bob's word that the nine blacks would be admitted into Central High. The governor stated his intention to respect the decisions of the United States District Court and to give his full cooperation in carrying out his responsibilities in respect to these decisions. Ike had misjudged Orville Faubus. Beneath the folksy exterior, Faubus was a shrewd political animal. But the specific question, will you give your okay to integration tomorrow morning? If it could be accomplished in a peaceful manner without any disorder and without violence, I have already so stated as a witness in Chancery Court and do so now. Do you believe that that can be accomplished peacefully and without disorder tomorrow morning? Not at the present time. You feel that violence is still a possibility? Yes. Therefore, will the National Guard troops continue to surround Central High School tomorrow morning? Well, the troops will still be on duty in the morning. On September 20th, Judge Davis ruled that the governor's deeds were unjust and ordered him to remove the Arkansas National Guard from Central High. You have now been put under a federal court injunction. Do you intend to comply with that federal court injunction? I still have a commander-in-chief, Governor Faubus, and I will report to him for instruction. Now that a federal court, however, has chosen to substitute its judgment for mine, as to how the peace and order should be preserved, I must temporarily, at least, abide. 
And therefore, I have issued orders that all units of the Arkansas National Guard stationed at the high schools in Little Rock be removed therefrom as soon as this can be accomplished. Your, your uh, name is Green, isn't it? Ernest Green. Ernest Green, yes. What is your plan for Monday? Are you going to go to school? We're waiting. We're just waiting. It's been quiet. There's been no incidents and no arrests up to this point. But of course, the Negro students haven't showed up yet. We don't know if they will. With the National Guard gone, the Little Rock police were assigned to keep the peace at Central High. But I don't know how long they'll live after they do get in here. We're going to ask you all to stand back. We're going to ask you to maintain order. On Monday, September 23rd, the nine black students made a second attempt to enter the school. This time, they got in through a side entrance. We've just got a report here on this end that the students are in. During violence inside Central, school authorities removed the nine black students after only three hours. I just say that we're here to stand, we're to stand for our rights. We should not be forcibly integrated or forcibly anything, and we do have a right to say we do not like it. It's not the policy of the South to integrate with the niggers. Mm -hmm. They've got no business going to school with our kids whenever they got schools better than ours, mm -hmm. or as equal to ours. An editor for a Memphis newspaper, Alex Wilson, was mistaken for one of the parents. What is your reaction to the latest flare-up reported from Little Rock? Well, it's something that I deplore very deeply. And it is the thing which I acted to prevent in the first place. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our courts. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. Governor, do you think that uh, the president possibly might have overstepped himself on this? <laughs> All I know is I feel like a MacArthur. I've been relieved. <laughs> <laughs> the arrival of the 101st Airborne was the first time the U.S. Army was used to enforce school desegregation. On September 26th, with the entire world watching, the nine black students tried again to start their school year. Proudly escorting the nine pupils that day was local NAACP leader, Mrs. Daisy Bates. One expression by one of the girls, the first morning the troops arrived in my home to take them to school. Yeah. Looked, she looked out there and she saw these troops and she said, Mrs. Bates, for the first time in my life, I feel truly like an American citizen. There's a great issue that's going to be solved. Patterns of action for future years may be determined. One of the great issues is the uh, matter of states' rights versus federal duties, another integration versus segregation. Well, this is a historic moment. The Negro children have just arrived. They are now getting out of their cars down there. I suppose it's uh, an analogy of being in the eye of the hurricane that is very calm on the inside. And we had, for the first time, uh, a thousand paratroopers who uh, were protecting uh, uh, our entrance into the school. And uh, I think that that was a fairly significant act. Now they're being escorted in by troops of the 101st Airborne Division. The president's order has been carried out. There has been isolated incidents of violence. There was one case on a nearby corner when these troops tried to make clusters of people disperse. These three men refused to disperse when ordered to do so also. The results, you can see. We are now an occupied territory. Bombers played the role of underdogs to the hill. Evidence of the naked force of the federal government 
is here apparent in these unsheathed bayonets in the back of school girls. There can be no question of the supremacy of the United States Army when used against a defenseless state. The 101st served as incongruous monitors in the halls and classrooms and on the athletic fields of Central High. In late November, with the crisis over, the troops returned to their base. For the nine teenagers, the triumph of the moment gave way to prolonged harassment by a minority of white students. Since when can the Supreme Court do like that? They can't do like that. They can't tell you you've got to go to school, niggers. They just say where the law is right or wrong. You think there'd be more trouble like that? Yes, sir, I do. Would you help make it if you had to? Yes, sir, I would. You don't want Negroes in school, then? No, sir. Is that a pretty general attitude? How do you feel about Negroes in school? Well, I don't think Negroes should go to school with the white people. They should stay in their own class. We're going to have to accept them gradually. We can't have them crammed down our throat. The students in the high school had very little to do with us. For the most part, they were willing to be rather quiet and be in the background and not to be seen as an integrationist. One of the nine, Minnie Jean Brown, finally was done in by the long ordeal. We were in a lunch line together, and uh, this white student was behind a male. He kept uh, egging Minnie, uh, calling a nigger. After so much provocation, I got mad. I really did. And I just said, well, I'm just going to let go this time. <laughs> so Minnie got so fed up with him, she, she had a bowl of chili and a tray. She took the bowl of chili and dumped it on his head. The school board suspended Minnie Jean Brown, and the remaining eight carried on through the spring semester. In May, Ernest Green was the first of the black students to graduate from Central High. Putting all sides together, I think it's turned out to be, uh, well, I would say an interesting year. <laughs> I guess that would be an understatement, but when you put all the sides together, we've had some nice times as well as some rough times. He pursued a business career that included a term as Assistant Secretary of Labor for Jimmy Carter. In the aftermath of the crisis, however, it was Governor Faubus who appeared to have benefited most. In the summer, a spectacular series of personal triumphs began for Orville Faubus with overwhelming victory in the Democratic primary. In September of 1958, the Arkansas legislature passed a series of laws giving the governor emergency powers to close any public school. I have signed into law... The Citing interference by U.S. Marshals and the NAACP, Faubus moved swiftly to prevent the start of the new school year. Armed with new laws, Faubus closed Central High and all of Little Rock's high schools. Faubus had kept faith with what seemed to be the great majority of Little Rock's voters. In the 1958-59 school year, most blacks did not attend high school at all, while whites went to makeshift private schools or schools outside the city. Faubus justified his actions in the name of states' rights. We must either choose to defend our rights against those who would usurp them or else surrender. But in June of 1959, a three-judge federal court ruled that the Arkansas school closing laws were illegal because they tried to evade a federal court order. Orville Faubus remained optimistic. Be still, sad heart. And he truly believed be that behind the dark cloud behind was a sun still shining on his cause. Thy fate is the common fate of all. Into each line, some rain must fall. Two months later, in August 1959, all Little Rock public schools, including Central High, reopened to blacks and whites. Quiet and calm prevailed not only over registration for the fall, but over the entire city. That's the change in atmosphere since 1957. Almost as if Little Rock had gotten professional in the handling of tensions, or as if the people of Little Rock were tired of making unpleasant news. So far, it's as if Little Rock were determined to keep this a local, routine matter, like any town signing up the pupils and looking toward the first warm football days of fall. And blacks, alongside whites, would continue their education in Little Rock's public schools in no small part due to the bravery of nine young pioneers. We did make an impact. Uh, we uh, went there, one, because we felt we were pursuing our own academic excellence 
But beyond that, we felt that uh, we were able to bring down some, uh, some racial and segregation barriers that existed in Little Rock, and that our attending that school and finishing it would make it uh, impossible for the white community uh, to ever have an all-white high school again. As school districts in the South struggled to desegregate in the 1950s and 60s, northern cities watched smugly from a distance. But all that changed in the 1970s. Now, it was Boston's turn to reap the whirlwind of hate and turmoil that came with the integration of public schools. The civil rights movement of the 1960s attracted limited interest in Boston, a city that was only 17% black. But change was in the air when Martin Luther King, who studied and preached in Boston as a young man, led 20,000 whites and blacks on a unity march in the Boston Common in 1965. Boston must become a testing ground for the ideals of freedom. That demonstration was just a taste of what was to come a decade later, for in Boston, de facto school segregation, white schools in white neighborhoods, black schools in black neighborhoods, was a way of life, a fact of life that many people in Boston chose to ignore. The black schools were quite inferior to the white schools. In a way, it was more sinister than the southern, the southern system. They knew about it down south. They, uh, it was their way of life. It was our way of life, but it wasn't supposed to be. Massachusetts passed its Racial Imbalance Act in 1965, prohibiting de facto school segregation. The law was fought at every turn by the Boston School Committee, the elected officials in charge of all public schools. For nine years, the all-white school committee sabotaged integration efforts with diversionary tactics, like offering special education programs to black students, but only in predominantly black schools. A former committee chairwoman, Louise Day Hicks, led the battle. We gather here today to demonstrate our total commitment to put the safety and the education of our children ahead of politicians and other poli political officers who make school children the innocent pawn of a nebulous state law. Because of the committee's persistent opposition, racial imbalance still existed in Boston 20 years after the Supreme Court ruled against school segregation. In June of 1974, federal judge Arthur Garrity, acting on a suit filed by the NAACP on behalf of a group of black parents, ordered desegregation to take place in Boston, but slowly, over two years. It was a plan that relied heavily on busing children out of their own neighborhoods, and that nearly tore Boston apart. Under a plan ordered last June, 45,000 of the 94,000 students in Boston will be bused. Judge Arthur Garrity ordered that the city make previously all-white schools at least 10% black and previously all-black schools at least 10% white. Almost half the city's schools will be affected. The reason that they're busing is to give the black kids a better education. And I think that's very important because, you know, we need a good base in order to be successful in this world. The school opens Thursday, and despite the summer campaign, city officials say they expect many white parents to keep their children out of the newly desegregated Boston public school system. Uh, this is under the guise of quality education, and there's no quality education at the end of the bus ride. And Boston Mayor Kevin White has spent a large part of the past eight months trying to talk parents into letting their children be bused away from neighborhood schools. It's our greatest strength in neighborhoods, but sometimes they're our greatest weaknesses because uh, they resist change. I was born on a hay street, up on B Street, so we the predominantly Irish neighborhoods of South Boston and Charlestown were the biggest supporters of the Boston School Committee. Over the years, the committee had become an Irish Catholic political machine, dispensing thousands of jobs and millions in contracts. Boston is not really a melting pot. It has guarded its ethnic diversity, which is precisely why Judge Garrity found it necessary to issue his busing order. The Irish of Charlestown and South Boston have long thought of themselves as separate communities within the city. 
Predictably, Roxbury's schools were as black as the schools in the other ethnic neighborhoods were white. It was all of this very effective segregation of schools which Judge Garrity found clearly unconstitutional. South Boston felt itself singled out by the extensive busing ordered under phase one of Judge Garrity's plan. When I was a kid, I went to school up on Broadway, then I went to school down on East Street, and then I went to Southie, and I graduated. This was fine. I figured the same thing is going to happen with my daughter. If they had a busload of Hungarians and they were jamming them down our throats, there'd be signs up there in Hungarian saying, hey, Hungarian, or whatever the Hungarian is for it. Same thing. It has nothing to do with the race. It's the fact that they're jamming them on us. We don't want these people. The anti-busing parents group called Roar, Restore Our Alienated Rights, argued that their rights were preserved under the Constitution. We are here protecting our children and our brother and sister's children. They have the right to attend the school of their choice. They have the right to enjoy the freedoms of this land. And we're doing God's work today. One target of their frustration was Senator Ted Kennedy, who had urged peaceful compliance with Judge Garrity's order. You know what it feels like to have a freedom denied you. you We've had me. the freedom of sending our children to neighborhood schools taken away from us. Can I, can I speak? Are you going to, isn't part of the our The people speaker? don't care to hear you. We're taking our kids with them. Going to put us out of the town and then catch them. Security men helped the senator through the crowd to the safety of his office in the federal building. Push your kids, Teddy! Even there, he was taunted by the crowd, which vented their frustration with staccato rhythms of angry fists. But finally, after a three-day delay, the buses rolled, and the nation's oldest public school system was desegregated. The mood of the crowd outside South Boston High was ugly. About 300 persons, mostly teenagers and some neighborhood residents, greeted 60 black students arriving in buses to the formerly all-white school, located in an area that has led opposition to the buzzing program. Amidst the shouting of threats and racial slurs, Louise Day Hicks, a school committee woman, tried to calm things down, but the shouting and shoving continued. The police then moved in, forcing the crowd away from the school and down a hill. Four persons were arrested, and a policeman received minor injuries in the scuffling. In the predominantly black sections of Boston, few whites showed up for classes, but there were no reports of any trouble. When classes were dismissed for the day, the large crowd was still on hand. Some buses were stoned, leaving the area this afternoon. At least eight children reportedly received minor injuries. We went to school, everything was all right, but when we came back, you know, all, it was all white, you know, old, old, young, and, you know, and little ones, you know, and teenagers, too, they started throwing rocks, so all the class was busted out. And do you know it was a white man who was driving the bus, and he, did you know he stopped there and let him hit us with the rocks and stuff? He didn't move, he stopped. The violence in South Boston marred what was otherwise a generally peaceful day throughout the city. But in the days that followed, defiance and violence spread beyond the schools. Defying a ban on demonstrations, several hundred residents of South Boston took to the streets today, protesting against the busing program. But the marchers ran into a beefed-up police force that repeatedly broke up the crowd's unsuccessful attempt to march to the symbol of their opposition, South Boston High. Schools in other neighborhoods were not immune to the growing violence. The incident took place between black and white students early today at Hyde Park High School. It was the most serious disruption within the schools to date. When it was over, seven students and a teacher had been injured at the school. Another student was stabbed on the way home. I doubt I'm coming back. I can't, I can't sit here and wonder whether I'm going to get killed walking down the hall. First day at school, I see kids with switchblades. You think I'm coming back to this? It became clear to the nation that the problem in Boston was not busing, but simply race. There has been no serious trouble at Hyde Park High since last Tuesday's clash between black and white students. But the tension resulting from that incident remains. Yesterday, police searched arriving students for weapons. The frisking and the fear caused some white youngsters to leave before classes began. I thought it was supposed to be 50-50. When I went there, it wasn't 50-50, so I'm not saying anything. There's just too many blacks. I you know, I, I don't feel safe, to tell you the truth. Faced with the mounting threat of a city-wide riot, 
Governor Francis Sargent mobilized three companies of the Massachusetts National Guard. Officials say the guardsmen will stay here, out of view, until the governor decides either to deploy them in the streets or send them home. While President Gerald Ford deplored the violence in Boston, he also questioned the wisdom of Judge Garrity's order. The court decision in that case, in my judgment, uh, was not the best solution to quality education in Boston. I have consistently opposed uh, forced busing to achieve racial balance as a solution to quality education. And therefore, I respectfully disagree, disagree with the judge's uh, order. Anti-busing forces welcomed the president's words as an endorsement for their side. The whole country will hear our voice and will bring us a constitutional amendment and no longer will forced busing be heard in any state across the nation. One month later, pro-busing demonstrators were inspired by the presence and the words of Martin Luther King's widow, Coretta Scott King. You're going to win your cause. I can affirm from personal experience that social change can be painful for all involved, for oppressor and oppressed. But such change is far more rewarding and healing than adhering to the poisonous ways of the past. But the 1974-75 school year was far from a healing experience for Boston. Boston was a city on trial in the nation's eyes as the 1975-76 school year approached, and so was the whole question of school desegregation. He should be able to enforce the law! While pro and anti-busing forces continued to battle in the streets, a second front in the war against busing was being fought in the courts. In May of 1975, legal maneuvers to forestall phase two of Judge Garrity's plan were rejected by the Supreme Court. For months now, Federal District Judge Arthur Garrity has been the target of anti-busing forces in Boston. Today, outside his courtroom, Garrity was once again the target, this time for last Saturday's order for a new busing plan next fall. One that, for the first time, would involve elementary school children and increase the number of students to be bused from 17 to 21,000. The reaction has been bitter. Tell me what you think of Judge Garrity's new plan. I think he stinks and so does his plan. Period. Across town, NAACP officials were holding a news conference when they learned the U.S. Supreme Court had just upheld Garrity's first busing order. I just received information that the United States Supreme Court has denied certiorari to the appeal of the Boston School Committee and Mayor White, which means that the order issued by Judge Garrity is now the law of the land and cannot be stopped. More than one third of Boston public school students would be bused that fall, with the Irish Catholic Charlestown section feeling the brunt of phase two. Looks like they might be in South Boston, but they ain't gonna get in here. What's gonna keep them out? People gotta keep them out. What's the sense of putting them in the, what are they forcing them in here for? We don't want them. We're only mothers and fathers fighting for our constitutional right to send our children to their local schools. Anti-busing forces have organized an information center with a powder keg as their symbol. They claim to be non-violent and non-racist, and instead criticize forced busing as a threat to their freedom and their children's safety. Well, I plan to boycott my children. And my two girls have been assigned to Roxbury. I'm pulling the two girls out because it's a very dangerous area. I don't want my children in there. Safety is also a major concern among black families, many of whom plan to keep their children off the buses, at least at first. They just uh, want her to go to Charlestown. And uh, we have two uh, uh, schools in our neighborhood that she can go to. And uh, I'm just not going to send her out there. Other blacks who are not wild about busing are going along with it in hopes it will mean a better education for their children. I'm not too pleased with uh, forced bus, and I feel that children should be able to attend the schools within the area that they are living. But if this is what has to be, we have to accept it. Without time for further debate, Boston police prepared for the worst on opening day. 
Local, state, and federal authorities have devised a joint strategy of heavy police deployment and tight security today for the opening of school. But tough, visible police and possible National Guard posture replaces a deliberately low profile used last year. This is the day Boston had agonized over all summer long, the beginning of the second year of court-ordered busing for integration in a city that never fully accepted the first year. Police were keeping a special eye on the white, close-knit community of Charlestown, where black students were to arrive for the first time. One by one, the buses came, under heavy police guard, with crowds kept at more than 100 yards from the schoolhouse steps. Many parents kept their children at home today, some fearing trouble, others protesting school busing. Police moved in to break up a sit-down protest, and one man was arrested on charges of assaulting an officer. At that point, the fragile calm that had hung over Charlestown was shattered. The MDC police had that blocked off. We did not go through their police lines. Captain McDonald sent these guys after us. They pushed, they shoved, they hit, they stepped on toes to women and little kids, and we're not putting up with it in this town. That's it. Later in the afternoon, just as schools were letting out, a car was set on fire in Charlestown, and another turned over. Despite the sporadic vandalism and the noisy crowds, the school buses were never interfered with, and there were no reports of any school children being injured. The violence was not confined to Charlestown. In the nearby town of Brookline, officials were investigating the firebombing last night at the birthplace of John F. Kennedy. Senator Edward Kennedy has been an outspoken proponent of busing, and the words, Bus Teddy, were painted on the sidewalk. On the eve of Boston's second week of court-ordered busing, several hundred women and children marched through the streets of Charlestown with flashlights and a police escort. It was the latest in a series of so-called mothers' marches against forced busing. The only thing that's going to stop busing is legislation, and that's what we're praying for. In Washington, D.C., the two sides debated a proposed constitutional amendment which would prohibit busing as a means to desegregate schools. Poor whites have been pitted against poor blacks to serve the conscience of the affluent. Among the proponents, Massachusetts Senator Edward Brooke, the nation's first black senator since Reconstruction. That all children are accorded their constitutional right to an equal educational opportunity. Meanwhile, the violence shifted back to the corridors of Boston's high schools. At South Boston High School today, black and white students clashed in a series of fights through much of the morning, both inside and outside the building, until police broke it up. Fifteen students were arrested. No one was seriously hurt. It was the most serious incident since expanded school busing began this fall. On December 9, 1975, Garrity placed South Boston under direct federal control, stripping the Boston School Committee of all authority. Black Tuesday, the Southeast called it. The action came after Judge Garrity complained his desegregation orders were being ignored by the Boston School Committee. The plan, he said, is not by a long shot being implemented at South Boston High School. Today, teachers protested the ruling and said they were showing up only out of concern for the safety of the students. We feel as if uh, this is undermining the morale of the faculty completely. I mean, I'm going in here with my... Uh... I'm just sick to my stomach going to this building today because of the uh, action. A white boycott of classes at South Boston High School was almost fully effective today with just 18 of the 573 whites enrolled showing up. Many of them are on the basketball squad and said they'd miss tonight's game if they skipped school. The project was part of a protest against a federal court's takeover of the school on grounds the school board has not worked for peaceful integration. Last night, Boston's NAACP headquarters was firebombed in an apparent protest of the Garrity ruling. But so far, no arrests have been made. As spring approached, a frontier mentality ran through the streets of Boston as respect for the law broke down. The violence began when 400 anti-busing demonstrators taking part in a so-called Father's March came up against a police line in South Boston High School. Some of the demonstrators threw stones at the police and they responded by racing into the crowd on horseback and on motorcycles trying to break it up. Three persons were arrested and uncounted number were reported injured. I'm just standing here and a guy came over and trotted me right in the head and knocked me right to the ground. Doing nothing. Finally, there was a call for peace and unity among all Bostonians. A crowd estimated at up to 100,000 filled the streets of Boston today, demonstrating for racial harmony. They called for an end to the violence between white and black that has marked two years of court-ordered busing, 
violence which has increased in recent weeks. As the crowd waited along the edge of the Boston Common, Senators Kennedy, Brooke, and Governor Dukakis arrived to lend their support. In May of 1976, with the city running out of money to pay for busing and for school security, Mayor White petitioned Judge Garrity to close the schools a month early. Garrity refused, but he tried to stabilize the situation by holding off on busing in predominantly Italian East Boston. However, the last hope of the anti-busing groups for a legal reversal of integration was dashed on June 14, 1976. The Supreme Court today refused to hear the appeals of Boston's court-ordered school busing plan. After all the political furor, the Boston case ended quietly in the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Warren Burger simply included it on a list of petitions for review that were denied without comment or dissent. The Supreme Court of the United States has spoken, but the people shall rule. And may God help those who have let them down. Some areas of the city understand that you cannot stand on a street corner and shout away the Constitution. Boston's celebration of the Bicentennial in July of 1976 brought a temporary respite to the hostilities that had plagued the city for more than two years. But it did not change the way that some people felt about desegregation. Don't come in and tell the Irish Catholic people of Charlestown to forget that 200 years of heritage. That government of King George's was wrong and this government is wrong now. Our forefathers fought that. We will fight busing. Despite the criticism that it failed, many believe that busing led to positive change in Boston. To say busing was a failure is really a very simplistic uh, comment. Probably the most important plus is it exposed children to racial diversity. I think the other plus is that it eliminated the blight of secret segregation. Exactly 200 years after the American Revolution began here, the fight for freedom was won in Boston once again. This time, over the right to equal education opportunities for everyone. For Little Rock and Boston, school desegregation was a bitter pill to swallow. Despite the violent confrontations, both crises reaffirmed the power of the federal government to enforce the law of the land and to overrule local authorities. The convulsions that rocked Little Rock and Boston showed once again that more than a hundred years after the end of the Civil War, the problems of race relations in America still simmered, threatening to boil over. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century.